Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, it's actually an honor for me to be here uh, because uh, really, um, you know, I started uh, reading Calvino's work first when I was relatively young compared to now. Anyway, I was 17, I was in school and it simultaneously resonated with the way that I thought with my young personality and it showed me uh, directions to go or ways to think or ways to be. And there's no possible way in a lecture of one hour or of any length actually that I will be able to do justice to his work or you know the subset of that of, of the way that his work has spoken to me. So uh, I'm not really gonna try to do anything in the whole. I'm gonna zoom in on one particular subject and develop it over the course of a few minutes. So uh, these six memos uh, were written for a set of poetry lectures at Harvard. And you might think, you know, wait a minute, this is a prose author. Why is he being invited uh, for poetry lectures? And he maybe answers a little bit of that in some of the memos. So in the second memo on quickness, he says, I'm convinced that writing prose should be no different from writing poetry. Both seek a mode of expression that is necessary, singular, dense, concise, and memorable, right? Um, so he's drawing some affinity between the way he writes and the way that poets write. Uh, he mentions a lot in the memos, the ideas of rhythm and rhyme from poetry, uh, which might, if you step back for a minute, seem weird, because isn't this the guy who's known for writing these puzzle-like books? Uh, for example, two of the books that I'm gonna talk about today, Invisible Cities, and If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler. Um, what, is that just an accident? Are these two different interests that he has, or are they the same? And I'm gonna make the case that they can be seen as two ends of a continuum or a spectrum. So the puzzle-like construction of these books is an extension of the kinds of things that happen in poetry, like rhythm and rhyme, but extended to much broader timescales and much broader uh, sessions of attention, let's say. So uh, here's a poem written by Shakespeare. It's some rhyming couplets. And as we've mentioned, there are two, at, at least two very obvious features of a poem like this, right? Uh, the words at the end rhyme, right? So each couple, uh, <laughs> each pair of lines uh, has a rhyme at the end. And leading up to that rhyme is the rhythm of the poem, right? It's written in a certain meter. And as you go from line to line, um, you get used to the meter, you enjoy it, right? You feel that rhythm. Um, so if you've uh, read a certain uh, rhyme at the end of a, of a line, you know that the upcoming line, whatever the words are that are in that line, it's, it's gonna rhyme. The end of it is gonna rhyme with the word that you just read. But you don't know exactly how it's gonna rhyme. If you did, it would be a really boring poem, right? You've probably read some poems like that where your brain knows what it's gonna say before you get there and those aren't considered to be the best poems. Um, so there's something happening here. Uh, I, will, I will frame it as uh, a creation of expectation. So when you get to a line in a poem that you know is gonna rhyme with something later, it creates an expectation. There's something now in your mind, some syllable or some sound that then is gonna be satisfied later when you read the line that rhymes with that. And similarly with rhythm or meter, um, as you're continuing along in the pace of a poem, um, the, um, there's an expectation that that rhythm will continue, right? That, that the momentum built up from that rhythm is gonna continue. So there's two things happening here. There's a consistency of meter, and there's a variation of the specifics of exactly how it rhymes. Uh, this kind of idea happens all over the place in arts, for example, in music. You know, in music theory, you can learn all sorts of variants of this idea. Uh, the one diagrammed here is this idea of an antecedent consequent structure, uh, wherein if you're, uh, say, writing a melody, then you intentionally craft a portion of the melody to feel incomplete or to feel that it requires resolution in some way. 
And then the consequent comes along and satisfies the expectation generated by the antecedent. And if you want to think of some example of that, then you could think of almost any song in the Western tradition. Uh, Jingle Bells, for example, is very definitely constructed that way. Um, in uh, the Quickness essay, Calvino says, just as rhymes help mark the rhythm of poems and songs, events can rhyme in prose narratives. Now, why is that? Why, why does he say events can rhyme? Well, it's because when an event happens in a story, first of all, it's probably important or the author would have glossed over it, right? You, you have some trust that the author is only telling you things that are worth your attention. And the fact that that event is important creates an expectation of a resolution or a consequence or something else that is going to happen due to this event, right? Your attention is brought in and hopefully uh, not wasted. So here, again, he's talking about uh, manipulating story structure. He says, the art that allows Scheherazade to save her own life consists in knowing how to link one story to the other and also how to break off just the, at just the right time, two operations on the continuity and discontinuity of time. It is a secret of rhythm of mastering time that we can trace to its origins, to the effect of meter in epic verse, and to the effects in prose narrative that make us want to hear what happens next. So he mentions epic verse here, which is a little different than the kind of smaller poem that I talked about, but I think that's because epic verse is a storytelling tradition, right? But it's the same concept that these aspects of poetry uh, have an analog in aspects of prose fiction, right? About this feeling, you know, we're all, we're all familiar with the feeling in stories about like, I want to know what happens next, right? There's a momentum that happens there that is analogous to the kind of momentum that happens in poetry or music. So <laughs> now that I've made that case, I'm going to jump away from it for a while, uh, apparently away, and we'll come back to it over the course of the talk. By the end, it'll be clear why I said all that stuff. But first I want to talk about invisible cities and the puzzle-like construction uh, with which it is made. So what's this book like? What, you know, what's it like? You sit down, you open the book, and what happens? Well, you see this. It's a table of contents. And it doesn't look quite like most tables of contents that you see. I mean, there's some big chapter numbers, maybe. I guess that's what those are. And then, or, or, or section numbers, and then maybe chapter numbers. And they say things like cities and memory, cities and desire, but unlike most chapter titles, they repeat. And if the first one repeats twice, so maybe that's not what they are. Like, I don't know what they are as the reader. And then there's the page numbers, but there's these other numbers over here that go one, two, one, three, two, one, four. It's weird, right? They're small numbers, and they're kind of, you know, bouncing around. They're not totally continuous. Uh, but then two down here seems much simpler. It goes like, oh, five, four, three, two, one. And, and there's chapter names, and they don't repeat all of a sudden, right? And then you keep looking, and this five, four, three, two, one non-repeating name pattern continues. And then you get to the end of the table of contents, and it's a scrambly again, just like chapter one, uh, in a way that, in fact, seems to mirror chapter one. So you might feel like, oh, there's some kind of structure happening already. But what's going on, right? There's all this five, four, three, two, one stuff in all these chapters. Is that a countdown to some event that happens at the end of the chapter? Am I supposed to read this backwards? Is this a signal that I'm supposed to read it one, two, three, four, five? But if that were so, then why are these all scrambled? I can't really do that here. So am I supposed to read all the ones out of all the chapters and then all the twos or all the threes? I don't know. It's just a, a mystery. And I, as the reader, am not really able to formulate an answer. Uh, so what I did, and what probably a lot of people do, is just start reading it the way you would a normal book. But this question is in the air, right? What is going on? Um, there's, if you look a little further at the table of contents, um, you can see a little bit more of a pattern that's happening, right? Most people probably don't look this closely. But if you do, uh, you can see that between each of these big section numbers, right, in each chapter, one old subject is dropped and a new one is added. So to go from six to seven, we say bye-bye to trading cities here. Then these four stay and move like up a number. And then a new thing, uh, continuous cities, pops in at the bottom. And if you look at that, at the table of contents, it doesn't evidently hold for one and nine, the weird ones, but for the rest of them, that's a consistent pattern. Um, and then if you look at one and nine, you can sort of feel like maybe 
they don't just mirror each other, but they fit together. So there was this uh, five, four, three, two at the beginning of nine, and there's a lone one over here, and like those could fit together to make five, four, three, two, one, right? And then five, four, three, two, one, and then five, four, and three, two, one, and five, and four, three, two, one. So if you want to look for intelligent construction just in the table of contents before you get to the actual book, right, you'll find plenty of it. Uh, then you get to the actual book, and the first thing that you read is uh, this part of the frame story that sort of out outlines the vignettes about the cities, and it signals to you that it's not really the main thing necessarily because it's in italics, right? So it's not, it's not the real part of the book, or uh, what, however you think about that. So you get to the first real part of the book. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely, I'm, I'm not trying to minimize the importance of the passage or anything, but I'm just saying that the fact that it's in italics indicates something. So you get to the non-italics, and uh, all of a sudden it's weird because you decided to read this book in order, and the very first thing it says is leaving there and proceeding for three days toward the east, and you're like, leaving where? What? So maybe I'm reading this wrong. I don't know, right? And it's, this is not a mistake. This is blatant, right? It's, uh, but what are you going to do, right? Like, what, what is the solution to this problem? <laughs> How are you going to not read it wrong? You don't know. And, and then subtler things start happening. So that was cities in memory, and as we say, these repeat. So the second one is cities in memory, and then there's a cities in desire. OK, so maybe you read this one, and you know, uh, it's a nice vignette, and, and you appreciate it, and you move on to this one, which is supposed to be cities in desire, but you're like, wait a minute, didn't I just read about desire? Because this one starts, uh, you know, when a man rides a long time through wild regions, he feels a desire for a city, and then at the bottom, the last sentence is, desires are already memories. So here's one that's linking desire and memory. But it's not actually, I cut it off a little bit, but it's not actually cities and desire, it's cities and memory. So if these are supposed to be strictly categorized, what's all the desire stuff? I don't know, right? And I, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, I still don't completely know. I'm not claiming to completely know, but I kind of have a feeling, right? But the point is, um, I, I don't believe that this is a mistake. Right? I believe that this is intentional, and I'll tell you why later. Uh, you can open to any random chapter in the middle, and literally, this was just like I opened to this chapter. This is not cherry-picked. Um, cities in Eyes 3, which is somewhere in the middle of the book. There's a city called Vasis, or however you pronounce that. And um, it is a cities in Eyes chapter, and you learn over the course that these headings do correlate to the subject matter of the chapter, so all the cities and eyes are about looking at things or something to do with eyes. But this one, you start, you know, you read it and you're like, wait, slender stilts? There's a category called thin cities. Why are we slender stilts? And the slender stilts reach way up into the sky. The city is lost above the clouds. Why isn't this in cities in the sky, right? And if you start actually, if you're an attentive reader and you start asking this kind of question, you'll see it all over the place, right? Like I said, this is not cherry picked. But let's go back to the question of the uh, chapter numbers. Um, this is a visualization that somebody made uh, called Invisible Cities uh, Made Visible. It's by, in the style of the internet, it's by some user named Monkey Lino uh, from a website called DeviantArt. Uh, so I can't attribute it any better than that. Um, but you know, here, uh, this person has just sort of put colored squares where uh, you know, in each uh, numbered chapter where each of these subjects shows up, and you can see the very regular pattern by looking at it this way, right? Visualization is powerful. These purple blocks at the top that look a little anomalous are the italicized uh, Kublai Khan Marco Polo chapters. Um, shows some other stuff, but I just, I just wanted to show that right now. One thing you might notice, this visualization did not include it, but if you look at uh, the chapter nine stuff and the chapter one stuff, remember we sort of thought maybe they fit together. You can confirm visually that in fact they do fit together and if they do this pattern uh, continues. Oh, this is a little blown out. The co color response in the TV is a little blown out. So I had to insert a slight amount of space here to like stretch these to make them fit. Uh, but they do, they do actually fit in terms of, um, if you do this, remember how I showed this? This is what that looks like graphically, right? So of course, once you've matched up the end of the book to the beginning like that, 
uh, you could imagine that as being something like a Mobius strip, but maybe without the twist, where you could just go around and around and around uh, forever if you wanted to, right? Um, oh, I forgot to say something, which is just, uh, if you think about this, if you look at this visualization and you think of these as like frames of a stop motion film or panels of a comic, you could almost get this visual of like a little five car caravan like traveling across the world, but what's the world in this case? It's this conceptual space of all these cities, right? So it's moving, you're like moving through the concepts as the book goes along, but of course, during the book, you don't have this overhead viewpoint, right? You're reading it, so you're like inside it, and so each little five chapter section is like a caravan moving along, and one of the concepts is passed in the rear view mirror, right, and the new concept comes in from the front. Uh, so then you can think about this as circumnavigating the globe if you wanted to. Um, is even more details if you start digging into it, right? So th there's 11 of these chapters, cities in the dead, cities in the sky, and all that stuff, but there's only, or 11, I need to get my terminology consistent, 11 topics, cities in the dead, cities in the sky, and stuff, and, but only nine of the big numbered chapters, but one and nine have 10 entries each, and the rest have five. So there's actually 11 sets of five cities and 11 topics, and if you wanted to try and think about why do some of the topics mix, you could imagine doing some kind of exercise where you have 11 topics along the top and 11 uh, sets of five along the down, and you mix together, uh, <laughs> you mix together each of these with, why well, I should have made a slide. But anyway, you can imagine some uh, exercise where you do that. Um, now, when I do that particular thing that I just sort of haphazardly mentioned, I can't convince myself that that's the right answer. It doesn't totally work out. Uh, but I have the feeling that something like that is going on, maybe with some kind of a scrambling. So what, what is happening in my mind is the point. The point isn't any of these specifics, right? What is happening to me as I investigate this book? First of all, I saw structure in that table of contents. Um, and it was structure that I was able to make sense out of and that was very regular. But then I see some unexplained things, like why do some of these chapters seem to have multiple subjects or whatever? Um, when I see unexplained things like that, I suspect that the answer to whatever questions I have may reside in further structure that was put into the novel as an explanation. And why do I think that, right? Um, well, because structure has already been demonstrated, right? Because the author has me in good hands in that sense. I feel like this is a thing that's been carefully thought out and systemic, right? If instead you pick up a copy of the daily newspaper and you start looking for patterns between all the articles, right, you're like a crazy conspiracy theorist or something. Um, but it is different, right? Because a certain, uh, a certain style of things having a meaning has been established, right? The numbers next to the chapters are not a coincidence, right? You may or may not, at some point you may get into things that have no visibility into you as a reader, but it's expected that they're not a coincidence, right? And you can go further and further, like what are some other sources of potential patterns? Every city has a name and that's very conspicuous and I don't know what the pattern is, but I suspect there is one, even if it's only personal to the author. By the way, if all this is actually documented somewhere, uh, then I'll sound really dumb saying I don't know, but I, this is my experience as the reader that I'm gonna uh, relate. Uh, but I suspect it's not because most writing that I read on these books doesn't seem to dig very far into these topics. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, is there a pattern to these concepts? Like these are all kind of weird and heterogeneous. Like it's sort of cities and things, but then it's like thin cities, thin cities, right? Uh, where, are these completely arbitrary? That would seem weird, given the regularity of the rest of the book. Where do they come from, right? I, I don't know, but I suspect there's something there. Um, is there a pattern to the way the stories are told? Like some of them start out with navigation instructions, and you see that often enough that you suspect that something's going on, right? Some start with addressing the listener or the reader directly. Some, a lot of them have a concept of inversion or duality in it, and by the time you get to the book, you might just think, oh, Calvino really likes inversion and duality, which might be true, or it might be that that was a rule in some generative system that he used, right? Um, now, to, to recap the point of all that, it's that the strength and consistency of the obvious patterns gives me faith that subtler patterns may be really there. Maybe not, 
right? I may be, the human mind has a great uh, capacity for uh, finding, seeking and finding patterns. But I have a strong reason to believe that attention in looking for future pa patterns is warranted. And I said six consistency here because consistency was to be the topic of the six memo. And I cannot pretend to have any idea what he would have uh, said in that memo. Um, but I do know that this is a very important um, foundational idea in what I learned from him through osmosis by reading his books. So I'm going to revisit this a lot over the rest of his talk, even though we have nothing to quote <laughs> to pull from. Um, anyway, so the book earned my trust, right? And, and I feel like energy that I invest in looking for patterns may be warranted. And so the way that I'm going to describe visual, uh, in, invisible cities as some kind of visual image is as a crystal, right, the tip of which we can see very clearly because it's displayed as the table of contents and stuff. But I don't, I can't see the entire structure, right? The crystal kind of recedes into shadow and there's some stuff that I don't know. And maybe some people know more than me, but I suspect that many readers know less than me, right? I'm in the middle somewhere. Um, now, when we're thinking about a work like this, we might presume there are two distinct mental phases that people go through. One, the initial phase, I'm new to the work and I'm noticing clues of this structure and it builds anticipation in my mind and I'm starting to connect the dots. And then two is some kind of angelic, like I've figured everything out and I'm up in heaven and I appreciate the final jewel-like structure, right? And I understand everything. And I think very few, if no readers, actually reach phase two with this book and I think it's not intended, right? So the real state is some one and a half somewhere that you have some appreciation of a partially understood clue structure and you're wondering about its extension into the mystery that you don't see. And that is your experience of the book. Um, and I think that's a very powerful way to shape an experience. Now you can do this wrong. Um, you can do this in a way that uh, abuses your audience, right? Um, if you create the feeling of some grand mystery and then you can't actually back it up in the end, then you're a little bit being abusive or callous. You're certainly not having a close relationship with your audience. You're trying to fool them in some sense, right? And that's not very good. But if you do it the right way or a, if, you, if you can back up the mystery that you lay out, then that searching for solutions and that yearning for mystery is another um, thing that can help bind the work together, right? It's another style of wanting to know what happens next or rhyming in poetry or something like that, but it's not quite in the same direction as those other two things. It's not as temporally bound. And that non-temporalness of it is very interesting to those of us in games, especially who are trying to build nonlinear games. Okay. Let's talk about another book, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, uh, which I deeply love this book. I deeply love the other book too. Um, the title is amazing, but we're not going to dwell on that. Okay, we're going to talk about uh, the basic pattern. Uh, the most, we're well, going to talk about a lot of patterns that happen in this book, but we'll start with the most basic one, the basic conceit, which is this pattern of interrupted novels. Uh, for anyone who hasn't read this or who hasn't read it in a long time, uh, what happens is uh, there's a little bit of a frame story around an introduction where you get ready to read a novel and then you get ready to read, it, it starts uh, describing this novel, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Uh, you are identified with the protagonist, so the protagonist is you, the reader, and then as soon as you finish the first chapter of the novel, it turns out that the rest of the novel uh, is ruined and you can't read it and you have to go try and get another copy and in the process of getting another copy, uh, you actually get tricked and you end up reading a different novel. And this happens over and over, right? So there's a frame story, there's a chapter of a novel, we go back to a frame story, there's a chapter of another novel, and so on for 10 fictional novels, right? Um, and all this happens in sequence in the book, a very clear, clearly defined sequence, unlike uh, Invisible Cities. Uh, I'm gonna draw this, though, as a sort of a main sequence and a background sequence. So I'm gonna draw the novel's this way, and I'm gonna draw the frame story sort of in the background. And why I'm doing that, you'll see later. Anyway, so, but this is a very prominent pattern that happens. You get into this rhythm, right? You start reading, uh, oh, we're, I'm in chapter of this, 
by the time it happens, it, so, so first, the first thing that may happen is you read the back of the dust jacket and you're spoiled on this whole concept, right? Which thanks publishers for doing that, right? But assuming that didn't happen, then somewhere around two or three, you get the idea, right? By the time you're about to finish leaning from a steep slope, you're like, okay, something's gonna happen that is gonna cut off. And especially by the time you're in here, you're well embedded in this pattern. So it's a rhythm, right? It's like a meter. Uh, it creates expectations of regularity. And those expectations are never violated, right? Through the whole book, they're there. It's consistent, right? There are other patterns. So there's a pattern of the titles, which is very closely related to this one, where uh, you know the title of each book strings together to make a very long run-on sentence at the end um, in something that's a little bit of a, maybe a little bit of a surprise or not, depending on your experience of reading the book. Um, oh, I already sort of mentioned this, but I didn't say the important part. So very close to this pattern of the interruption of novels, but, uh, well, we'll call it the same one. I was gonna say it's close but distinct, but we'll call it the same one. Um, but the interesting thing about this pattern of interruption of novels is not just that there's a regularity, but there are variations, right? And this is what makes it, uh, this is what makes us really enjoy reading it or a funny story or something, which is, you know, but, so you get around here and you know that this is gonna happen again and again, but the, you know, the no, uh, Calvino needs to come up with reasons why it happens, right? He has to have an excuse for why you can't read the rest of this novel and why you can't read the rest of this one. And um, you, so, so not only do you have an expectation that you're gonna be cut off, but you're wondering, uh, I wonder how I'm gonna be cut off this time, right? I wonder what the next thing is gonna be. And as you start reading the frame story, you're like, oh, oh, that was a funny one or whatever, right? Exactly in the way if you have a poem, you know what, sound, what syllable it's gonna rhyme with, but you don't know how yet, right? It's the same kind of expectation. So how will, be, how will the novel be interrupted this time is a pattern of expectation and satisfaction that happens over the course of this book. There's a pattern of Ludmila's introductions, um, which is slightly more subtle, but not really. I think basically everyone who reads this book notices this, where uh, there's a very prominent character in the book who is present throughout the frame story. And uh, well, except for the very first one where you haven't met her yet. Um, but she has seemingly magical properties. So for example, she'll express what kind of book that she wants to read, and then somehow either that calls into being or in some way is magically related to whatever the next book happens to be because it satisfies what she's interested in. Um, in the beginning of the book, these are relatively straightforward. Like, oh, you know, she says something like, the book I would like to read now is a novel in which you sense the story arriving, like still vague thunder, the historical story along with the individual story, and so on and so on, right? But a funny thing happens, okay? Um, you set up this pattern just like all the other patterns, and as the reader, you're expecting it, and frankly, I, I, I personally enjoyed this very much because I like her character, and I always, I always look forward to this paragraph. I like it, and then something happens where uh, the book sort of forcibly separates the protagonist and Ludmila, so she's not even really in the story anymore. She's, she is a very important character, but she becomes magically pervasively in the background rather than being a foreground character that's with the narrator, right? And in your mind, this presents a problem, like how's she gonna do this anymore? How's she gonna satisfy this pattern that's been set up? And it just gets funnier and funnier, I think, or, or interestinger and interestinger, because you have this expectation that this will happen, and it keeps happening, but it keeps happening in, um, through variations that have to stretch to make it happen. So for example, there's a character called Corinna who is not stated to be exactly the same as Ludmila's sister who you were introduced with earlier, but is in some way or another, right? Um, the, both characters, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a fiction person at heart, but both characters have taken on by this point some kind of magical larger than life existence, we'll say. And, and so it's not too surprising that her sister might be some chimeric being, right? Uh, that, whatever, I won't. <laughs> anyway, 
the, the protagonist is trying to pin down the identity of this person and asks, hey, do you have a sister? And she says, yes, I do have a sister. My sister says she loves novels where you feel an elemental strength, primordial telluric. That's exactly what she says, telluric. And it's very funny, right? And um, it's just a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing that he starts doing about completing, uh, completing this sequence. In It's almost like you know, you're, you're watching circus acts or something, and they start doing things that are very impressive, right? Um, and the, the impressiveness of it, you know, the fact that the guy's doing a flip is part of what makes it enjoyable, right? The fact that these variations start doing flips or whatever is part of what makes them enjoyable. A little later, you know, the protagonist has a dream, and, uh, you know, she shows up in the dream and so forth. Um, just to give another example. Okay. So I've been beating this uh, into the ground, but I'll once again and say because of consistency in these patterns that we see, we have expectations and we enjoy seeing the variations in how the expectations play out. Now, those are all the clear patterns in the book. They are not all the patterns in the book. And again, I've not seen the rest of this stuff documented. I'm speaking uh, as my experience as a reader. So toward the end of the first novel, uh, If on a Winter's Night, a Traveler, um, you know, the protagonist is a spy. Actually, there's a lot of spies in these novels, so you might want to think about that. But the protagonist of this first one is a spy of some kind. He's supposed to make contact. And the police chief comes to him and meets him and says, they've killed Jan, clear out. And you're like, OK, cool. It's a dramatic thing, fine. And then you read the frame story, and then you go on and you read the second novel, which is introduced to you as not having anything to do with the first novel, right? Separate story, separate style. You start reading it, and it says every moment you discover there is a new character. You don't know how many people there are in this immense kitchen of ours, et cetera, et cetera, um, because different names can belong to the same character indicated according to the circumstances, by baptismal name, nickname, surname, or patronymic, and even by appellations such as Jan's Widow or The Apprentice from the Corn Shop. Right? And as soon as, an attentive reader, as soon as they read this, is going to be like, wait a second, Jan is from the other book, I think, and may, maybe I misremembered the name, and you flip back, and you're like, nope, that's Jan who died, and now we're talking about Jan's widow in a different, and then, and then you read through the rest of this book, and you're like, are they related in some way? And it's like, no, totally different setting, totally different characters, but there's like a link there. So, because of the consistency of all these other patterns, a certain kind of reader could go into a pattern hunting mode. And when you do that, you will find things. Um, I do not have notes from last time I uh, read the book, uh, but over the past couple days, I went back and reviewed the book to find as much of this pattern as I could. Uh, and I'll tell you how it goes, because it's really, it's really funny, and it, it, the, the way that this goes is a little bit central to how I design video games now. Even though I haven't even found the whole pattern, right? That's how cool this is. All right, so we start out, and so I've got, I've got what the connections are between the chapters in these boxes, and I've got question marks where I didn't find it this time. I don't know if I found it before or not. I don't know if there is one. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, so the connection between the first chapter and the second one is Jan, not only Jan, but the fact that there's a guy named Jan who died, right? Um, but Calvino knows he's putting you, the attentive reader, into pattern hunting mode. And he does an amazing, hilarious thing because the fictional conceit in this frame story that gets you, that tricks the protagonist of the novel as a whole from reading this novel into this novel is that there are two novels where many of the characters and places have the same names as each other. So he basically sets out a pattern and then he says, well, of course you're going to find lots of names. I can neither confirm nor deny that this pattern that you're looking for is consistent in this novel, because of course, there's tons of names are the same. But you keep reading. And then this name, Cotterer, shows up, uh, which by now is actually very familiar to you, because it was a major family name in both of these books. It shows up in this one, just like tossed offhand, right? If you hadn't read these, it would be nothing special. But you see, you're like, I, right? And then that's where I lose the scent. And like I said, it may be because I missed something, or it may be because these are very, very subtle, right? But later I pick up the scent, so the character Lorna, different character Lorna, same name between these two. Uh, lines that intersect has a very funny scene with a bunch of motorcycles, one of which is Kawasaki brand. And then Carpet of Leaves is uh, set in Japan, and there's a Professor Kawasaki. 
Then I lose the trail again. Uh, then between these two stories, there's Amaranta. So we sort of see what the pattern is, is it's always a name of a character, at least in one of them, right? Here's a motorcycle, but it's a name of a character here. It's a proper names that we're looking for, and that becomes important, okay? But so the thing that I'm super impressed by so far is he's got such a mastery of this pattern setup that he puts a huge joke like right here. This might be the funniest joke in the book. There's something else I'm gonna say in a minute is the funniest joke, but I think that's actually the funniest joke. Um, so again, I have, even though I haven't found this whole sequence, even when I've only seen this much of it, I have faith that it's a sequence. Again, because of the consistency, I can see the, the planned geometry of the rest of the novel. So I'm like, okay, this is part of it. This is part of it, right? Now, an interesting thing happens over the last couple days. Like I said, I don't remember what happened last time I read this because it was like 20 years ago, more, more than that. Um, I'm looking for proper names because that's what he's primed me to look for. And I'm looking around the places where I'm lost because I don't know, right? It's looking intensively in here. And I notice, wait a minute, Socrates is mentioned in the frame story and mentioned here, which in most books, if, if you hadn't seen the rest of this pattern, you'd be like, yeah, that's a coincidence, whatever. But he's set you up to look for names of people. So now there's a weird thing where it's like, oh, maybe there's a connection outward to the frame story. And then I notice that Homer is mentioned here and here, which again would be a coincidence, but maybe not. This is very precarious though, because if you were to try to look for a similar pattern in this outer frame story, you can't do it the same way because it's one story. So like having the same characters and the same locations mentioned is part of what makes it a coherent story. So you can't really do the same thing. But there's a suspicion here built that something is going on and maybe that's why I can't find things here. Maybe the nature of this jump to the outer story and something very subtle out there, maybe how that connects to the inner thing is uh, explanatory of why I can't find those. I don't know, I don't know. Then I look down here <laughs> at this other one that I can't find. And again, we see something that would be very easily uh, described as a coincidence or a non-pattern most of the time, but now I'm not sure about. And I'm not saying this is the connection, but I'm saying I notice it and I don't think it's a mistake that I notice it, right? So Carpet of Leaves is a story about a young man doing sense explorations and it's also keyed around nature. And there's a lot of descriptions of trees like ginkgo and maple and water lily. And this, we'll call it the second funniest joke in the whole book uh, is centers around the Caucasian elm and evil translators, by the way. It's, it's a wonderful joke. Okay, so the next story, uh, Empty Grave, has quite conspicuously all these characters named after the Spanish words for different trees and plants. And this is not something that you see elsewhere, right? So it's not like in all the chapters, the names are meaningful in some way that I could find. But in this one that comes right after this one, which by the way is also named after plants, there is this vague connection. And it goes in this place where I couldn't find, maybe because I'm stupid or maybe because it doesn't exist, I couldn't find a more specific connection about names. But this is about names. Right? So maybe the pattern is disappearing into something more subtle than appearing. I, I don't know. And to this day, I don't know, right? Um, and then there's some more subtle things that you might notice. We, for purposes of brevity, we're going to skip that. Uh, and this is not to say that I'm claiming that all patterns in this book or any book are meant to be found by the reader. So for example, there's an essay called How I Wrote One of My Books in which Calvino outlines the construction of this book, and he talks about it via this process of semiotic squares, which is not really something that I'm that familiar with, but he uses it to generate relationships and actions between characters and objects. Um, and it, the basic structure is that, uh, you know, it starts at just one relationship and goes to two, three, four toward the middle of the book, and then it comes back down to one toward the end. And I certainly had no idea about that construction uh, when reading the book, and I don't think it's really intended that anybody ever would, like how would you, right? Um, but I think the structure is meant to be felt a little bit, and I did feel it in the sense of I felt like the book, you know, got more harried and complex toward the middle and simpler toward the end. The last chapter is super short, right? Um, anyway, so if I'm gonna describe these two books relative to each other, uh, Invisible Cities, I described like a crystal. Um, Winter's Night, I don't feel is crystalline. It's, uh, it's more about sequences, and it's more about 
uh, playing with sequences, um, enjoying the variations, and in the case of this one, uh, screwing around so much that sometimes we break the sequence uh, or make it you know, so hard to find that I didn't find it in the time that I spent trying to prepare for this talk. Uh, so this is what I'm going to call a pattern break. Like both, this is a kind of a break, um, and this is a kind of a break. And this is central to what I do in, in games now. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Because we're going to talk about games now. So uh, first is Braid, uh, which is a game I worked on from 2004 to 8. And it was inspired very directly by Invisible Cities, though Winter's Night is in there as well. Um, and a book called Einstein's Dreams, uh, which was written by a physicist from MIT named Alan Lightman, which is very, very obviously inspired by Invisible Cities in structure, uh, but also by some other stuff like Cosmic Comics and whatnot. Um, so the sort of the premise of Einstein's Dreams is that it's about Albert Einstein while he's working as a patent clerk, but he's troubled by, you know, why can't we resolve the scientific measurements of light, like what's the explanation for how light could behave and therefore how the universe really works because light is so fundamental. He's basically trying to figure out the theory of relativity, right? And, uh, you know, this, the excuse for the vignettes is that he goes to sleep at night and has these dreams of the universe working different ways and those are analogous to the cities in Invisible Cities. Okay. Um, I, I got excited by by this uh, sequence. And I was like, you know, I'm in games, which is different from books, um, but this is sort of, you know, <laughs> two things sort of starts, um, sort of starts a, a sequence. So uh, how would I do something in this tradition if I like both of these books? How do I continue that into games? And my initial idea was to do something that was about physics, but in a game world, uh, because you know, the thing about fiction is you can only like write about the world and tell people about it. But in games, uh, there's a two, two things. Um, one is you actually make the world work so people can experience it. But the blessing and the curse about that, the curse is you have to actually make it work, which is hard. Um, but it's exciting because you have a very hard problem to work on that's exciting. Um, so my initial idea was to make a game that was about quantum mechanics, like the weird things that happen at the quantum scale that don't seem to make sense. But I was going to blow them up in a sort of cosmic comics-like way. I was going to blow them up to the scale of regular people and just see what happens, what game systems could I build, and that kind of thing. Um, and what actually happened was, uh, you know, I started thinking about the arrow of time being bidirectional and implemented a rewind system, kind of like how you can rewind things on a VCR. And I very quickly saw that that was enough to make a whole game. So, so that's what this game became, was a little bit inspired by the structure of something like Invisible Cities. But instead of cities, we have game worlds. And we only have six because they're much bigger, right? And uh, in each world, uh, the behavior of time is different, right? So it's, it was important to the success of this game. You know, there's a difference between in, in being inspired by and copying, right? If you try to copy the structure of something like Invisible Cities, you're just going to destroy yourself because your thing is not going to fit that structure. So it was about being inspired by that structure and seeing what could echo that but could fit this new thing that I'm trying to do. Uh, okay. Now, there's, I, I hadn't elaborated all these things that I've said earlier in the talk very specifically, but I was very aware of structure being important. So there's six worlds, right? They all have different visual schemes. They're color-coded. Uh, the nature of the puzzles in each world is very specific to that world. So there's no crossover or confusion between the subject matter of one or another. That's actually different from, visuals, from Invisible Cities, for example, I think. Um, there's the equivalent of a frame story, which is you know, this house that you live in to go out to all the different worlds, and then uh, these kinds of introduction screens that go into each of the individual worlds. right? Um, there's other elements of, of structure, like the level orders within the worlds and uh, the order of the worlds, which we'll talk about in a second, right? Um, and then also, we set expectations in a very fiction-like way early on, but again, without words. So uh, at the beginning of the game, if you climb up the ladder from that room, if you climb up the ladder from here, right, you see this ladder up there, 
you go here and the ladder stops and there's more segments of it hidden away and there's obviously a room up there that you want to get to and pull that switch and you don't know what the switch is going to do, but you know you want to get there, but you know you can't. And so it sets this expectation that then you can wonder about every time you come back to this house over the course of the game and you slowly see your progress uh, and suspense build as these pieces of the ladder slot into place. Um, now, in addition to all that stuff without words, there's stuff with words. Uh, so I was inspired uh, by Invisible Cities to do a constrained writing exercise here. I make no warranties about the quality of the prose, especially when compared with you know, great authors. Um, but simply stating the fact that there is a constrained writing exercise here, um, where each, before each world, uh, there's a little fiction piece. Uh, they're all written in different styles kind of like in Winter's Night, but the styles are not inspired by other authors. They're inspired by however time behaves in that particular world. Um, they're all about some interaction between Tim and the princess where, where the nature of that interaction is determined by the mechanics of time in that world. And they all, as a sort of more like a poetic rhyme at the end, they all depict uh, or talk about a castle uh, whose nature is a little bit determined by the time mechanic of that world, except where I break the pattern intentionally this stops happening at world five and then comes back in world one. So as an example, you know, here's a short one where you just said, you know, there's a castle where the flags flutter even when the wind has expired. It's a, it's a way of creating a visual that then bridges you into the way that time is going to behave. And it's a way of establishing a regularity between the chapters. Now this one, the castle one is pretty subtle and I don't, uh, I don't expect most players to notice it consciously but it's there to like reinforce the feeling of structure. Uh, here's a more regular structure that's much more obvious. So in the tradition of many video games, especially uh, from England, I think, levels in this game are named. And when you go to a new level, you see the title, for example, three easy pieces just on a black screen with an icon and then the title fades out and you can play the level. Uh, this is a very consistent pattern. It goes and goes for 25 or 30 levels. Uh, and then one day you come to one that doesn't have a name. It just has an image and it fades into the level and it still doesn't have an image. And the player feels like, uh, that's weird. I don't know what that means, but it's different, right? It's a little bit like the slight confusion upon starting Invisible Cities and seeing the scrambled numbers and being like, I don't know what that means, but it seems important. Um, uh, from my side, as the author, what happened was um, I felt like the solution to this puzzle had a little bit of gravitas to it, and I didn't want to spoil it by uh, giving the level a cutesy name like a lot of the other levels. And the idea just came like, okay, we can, we can do a sequence break here. And, uh, and just leave it <laughs> with no name. And then I extrapolated out from there what the player experience would be. Right? Um, so there's another, another thing very much inspired by Invisible Cities, which is uh, as you walk into the first cloud screen from the house, you start on world two. Uh, it is not world one, and this again creates confusion and expectation, right? Why isn't this world one? Is world one the house that I came from? Uh, it didn't seem like a world in the platformer sense, like there weren't like challenges or anything. I didn't hardly do anything. So why is this world two? Right? So it creates expectation and uncertainty. And then as you continue to make your way through the game, it's world three, world four, world five. And by the way, these are all sort of named in parallel. So they're all time and something that has to do with the nature of the thing being introduced in that. And again, the time and is very reminiscent of the cities and thing. Um, and then on world six, I break it intentionally, right? Because, uh, for many reasons, one of which is we're ramping toward the end of the game, so we want to make the player feel like, or help the player feel like, uh, things are, change is one way that you know that things are important now, right? Um, and again, the other thing I wanted to do is uh, introduce a little bit of, uh, start to introduce a little bit of uncertainty as we ramp toward the end. Um, now, like I said, people are trying to get into this room the whole time, uh, by the time you finally do, you get to this cloud screen in which I super break the pattern, right? So first of all, it doesn't go in sequence anymore. It's one, which breaks the numeric sequence but answers the expectation set up way at the beginning about where the hell is world one. But then 
It's also an extra, extra pattern break because this whole world has no name. It's just like one. So what's going on? Is it a bug in the game? Maybe not. Um, it just, it seems a little bit final maybe, right? And this is, uh, it's apropos for the end of the game. There's other weird stuff like the doors here go backwards and people don't necessarily know what that's about at the beginning. Um, and so we not only answer an expectation here, but this pattern break of not titling this world underlines uh, the answer and charges it with extra significance a little bit. All right, let's talk about The Witness. More recent game, came out last year. Uh, it's got an overall hierarchical structure to the puzzles, lots of uh, structures actually, uh, but the, the most obvious one is that it's an island uh, consisting of relatively encapsulated areas. So, you know, this red forest is some area like Braid where all the puzzles have something to do with each other. Um, this desert ruin is an area, um, you know, uh, this tower, for example, and, and so on, right? Uh, but uh, one of the primary concerns in The Witness was to do everything with nonverbal communication, the way we did a little bit of stuff in Braid. So the game starts and you're just in a dark hallway. There's no like dramatic fiction introduction or anything. It's just like you're in a dark hallway. There's something eye-catching at the end. That's it. And you can walk toward it. And whoops. And when you do, you get a little bit of prompting because computers are confusing. So it tells you what the controls are. Uh, but from there, that's about all the instruction that you receive. So you find that you could trace a line on this uh, glowing uh, iPad-like little panel thing. And when you do that, the door opens and lets you into this cave. In the cave, uh, you turn and you find another panel and it's almost as dead simple as that last one, which was just a straight line, remember? There's nothing really hard about this. You just trace, right? This is only one baby step more complex. You just trace and go around a corner, right? This is very simple. Uh, this lets you into a hallway where you get out into a yard where we start giving you things of increasing complexity. And so we ratchet it up small step by small step, never using verbal instructions and thereby uh, eventually get into quite complex uh, ideas. So uh, one of the ways that we do that is through sequences of puzzles. So you could be walking around and see this. This is in the relatively early game. And it's got one panel that's lit up and a bunch that are turned off and it's got these black and white spots in it and you may not have ever even seen those in the game before. Uh, and you almost definitely don't know what they mean. Unless you were weird and explored the rest of the island first or watched YouTube. Uh, <laughs> so you walk up and you play one. And um, it's a very simple uh, grid with like three horizontal ways to go to get to the ending. And uh, the most natural and simple one is to go in the middle. And, as you learned in the tutorial yard, that's the one that's right, and so it turns on the next panel. And that's it for that panel. Uh, the next panel is basically the same thing, but with a slight complication. You start in the corners, and that means that the thing that you have to draw to solve this is more like a zigzaggy thing, but it's still just as simple, and most people get that right away. Um, then we start building the concept, right? So, oh, by the way, there can be more than one uh, black spot. What do you do, you know? And uh, eventually, we end up doing something that's like a nonverbal paragraph made out of nonverbal sentences, right? And you had to wrestle with the sentences to solve each puzzle. And you probably had to have a, at least a fairly good understanding of what each idea is in order to solve it. Otherwise, you would have just been stuck. So if I want to cover very quickly what this is, uh, there is such a thing as black and white spots. And you maybe have to put your line between them. The line can be a little more complicated as necessary. There can be more than one black spot. Oh, they can be arranged in two dimensions instead of one. Oh, there can also be more than one white spot and they could be arranged in more complex groups. Um, oh, the orientation that you wind around that group with your line might have to be different depending on where you're trying to get to. Oh, there could also be disjoint groups of white spots or at least a lone guy and there can also be blank squares with no spots in them. What do you, what do, you do, right? And then the way that you wind around the set of those two things uh, may be a little bit surprising depending on where you need to go. Uh, and then the last one here is a pattern break. And interestingly, I think, uh, 
So it's, it's very important in a game like this. Video games are very frustrating and hard for people to play in the first place. So if you choose to break a pattern, you have to be very careful about what you break. Um, you don't want to undermine people's fundamental confidence in the game, right? Um, because you want the, the confidence that is born of consistency. And so because this is a puzzle that people uh, encounter early, the pattern break is not a break in the consistency of concepts. It's not a break in the way you interact with anything. Instead, it's a, a break of a pattern that I try to convince the player to have and usually works, which is this little group down here that people are focusing on becomes this little T shape and it stays the same. And I encourage people to think of that as its own thing and to be separate from this. And this last one is like, oh, gotcha. It could, it could be the same group and you can't solve it otherwise unless you start thinking of this differently than you thought of that, right? Um, so to speak for a moment about the, we're not gonna go into any more of these, uh, but just to state what the structures are uh, that help, that crisscross the game in different ways, right? Um, it's designed for an attention arc, right? Where you start looking at these puzzles that are self-contained like the black and white spots, and then you start doing puzzles that are not so self-contained. We'll have an example of that in a bit. And then toward the end of the game, you need some kind of field awareness where you're paying attention to everything and wondering what the significance of everything is. Um, there's a strict individual topic per area, as I mentioned, um, but the game's also stratified by the feedback level of the things that you're being asked to do. So there's one uh, level of this strata, there's one stratum uh, that is obvious puzzles like those square panels like we saw. Uh, there's a layer of more secret puzzles um, that also you know when you found them and you know when you've successfully solved them, the game gives you feedback, but uh, it's harder to find them and you may miss them entirely. Like you could play the whole game and never see them, right? Never know that they're there. Uh, and then there's these things called visual surprises, which are super more in that direction where, well, we call them internally visual surprises. The game doesn't call them anything. Um, but they're just things that are interesting visually around the island that you can notice or not. Um, so it's like a puzzle, like if you successfully notice it, it's like, oh, I, I get it, I solved this, but there's no uh, list of them, right? There's no way to lead you to them and there's no acknowledgement that you solved them. It's just purely internal satisfaction. So there's some spectrum here driving from the sort of external reward-based satisfaction, not even that much in that direction, but a little bit, toward purely internal satisfaction. Uh, and then there's a hierarchical relation of the puzzles around the island, which we will talk about uh, now. So here's one scale of puzzle, right? Or one sequence that's coherent. These are arranged into areas, uh, like I mentioned before, and you may reach the end of an area and find a gold box. And when you manage to activate the gold box, some little machinery pops up and shoots a beam at this mountain. And the first time that happens, just a dramatic event, seems kind of cool. And you know, this game has mostly not had anything. It's a, it's a very motionless game, so to have some motion is kind of cool. Um, but you know, in Winter's Night, the first time Ludmila introduces a new chapter that is also not yet a pattern. It's just a cute paragraph, like, oh, that's nice. She's talking about what she would like to read, right? You don't know it's a pattern until maybe when you read the second one, and that's the suggestion, like, oh, maybe this is gonna keep happening, right? The third time she does it, you're like, oh yeah, I know, what's, I know for sure what's going on, right? And then, and then you've definitely built that expectation that this will continue, right? So the same thing here. That may have been the first gold box that you saw, but now you might not have even noticed them as you were walking around, but now you'll notice them. Hey, there's one at the top of that tower and at the top of that other tower and peeking out from the bushes. I recognize those now and I know that I'm trying to get them, even though the game's never said, try to get to the gold box. Uh, and then the second time I manage to get to one and turn it on, another beam happens. And not only does another beam happen, but it points at the same place, right? So the second time is a strong suggestion that this is a pattern. The third time is straight up confirmation. All these beams are gonna point at the mountain. And then maybe if one doesn't, that's a surprise. Um, and then especially by the time you get to around five or something as in this picture, you know the rhythm is established, right? Just like the rhythm of a poem is established, the rhythm of how you're supposed to play this game 
and what you're trying to do is established. Now, this is at a much, much longer attention scale than in something like a poem, right? It might be a couple of hours between when you turn on any two of these lasers, right? To turn on these five might be 10 or 15 hours of gameplay. But one of the things I learned from Invisible Cities and uh, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler is that these structures of I want to know what happens next can happen at many different scales, right? And so what I was doing here was trying to stretch it out at a very, very long scale, and it works. Uh, now, you could, not only does this tell you what you want to do, but it imbues this kind of mountain, this mountain, I mean, uh, with more importance than it might otherwise have. It sort of seems important because it's up high and you see it all the time, but it's extra important because all these beams think it's really important, right? That tells you something. And then you go up there and you're like, oh, there's another gold box. I know what those are. Um, and there's five doors open, which uh, corresponds to the number of uh, beams that I have going. And if I don't, I'm not, not, if I'm not completely sure that those numbers are the same, I can activate another beam and see if this one opens. And I feel like, oh, well, that's five out of seven. So when I open seven, probably I can trace this thing that looks very recognizable because it's the thing that I saw at the start of the game, but turned sideways. And then something cool is going to happen, right? So it's like that thing in Braid, but it stretched out at a much longer uh, time scale and requires more active exploration because you have to hike up to this mountain to see this stuff. But this establishes a regularity over a long time. There's the regularity of those sequences of puzzles and the regularity of the beams. And that consistency, just like I was talking about my reading experience of Invisible Cities and uh, Winter's Night, that consistency can lead you to think about other things that you saw. So for example, man, I was playing this game and I saw these ominous <coughs> black obelisks around and they seem important. That seems like it's supposed to be something, but it's just this inert thing. Like what, what is the pattern that explains these things? Maybe I can figure it out somehow. I, I don't know yet, right? It's a mystery that's been set up. There's an expectation now that if I look hard enough, I will find the answer to what this is. If you think about it consciously, and not all players will think about that so consciously, but even if you don't realize it, it's, it's a tenet of my design that these things still dwell in, in the subconscious and create a stronger experience. Um, another thing, what, what's the deal with that very obvious cloud that looks stormy, but all the other clouds are bright and white. Like, what is that? What does that mean? Is it a bug in the game? Well, probably not, because I see all these other patterns, and everything else that I've run into has eventually proved to be meaningful. So maybe this is meaningful also, right? I don't know why, but but I believe that it is because the game has has uh, lived up to lived up to its promises of other similar things having meaning, right? And so, you know, if, if this happened in a game without patterns, it would just be a random thing. It wouldn't necessarily inspire investigation very much, right? So, uh, coming around to the end, I want to go back to quoting Calvino for a minute um, to explain why all this makes sense. He says, again, in Memo 2, we might say that as soon as an object appears in a narrative, it becomes charged with special force, becomes like the pole in a magnetic field or a node in an invisible network of relations. The object's symbolic value can be explicit or not, but it is always present. We might even say that any object in a narrative is a magic object. That last sentence, when I read it, I was like, wow, that's exactly, <laughs> makes a lot of sense. The thing that makes fiction work, except for certain kinds of very recent fiction is that the author isn't like wasting your time, you know? Like they're, the, I mean, you know, there are books that are like trying to be unreadable. I don't know if you've ever read one of those. Like the, that, that, that's their explicit goal. It's very postmodern. Um, so, right, because that's the central, uh, it's like the underlying contract of fiction <laughs> is that the author's telling you this because it's worth your time, right? And because then things are worth your time, when you see something, it's probably important. And, and that's what he's talking about here, that any object in a narrative is a magic object. Um, and so that's what this cloud is, right? It's a magic object. You see it, and it takes your attention and makes a promise that this will be resolved in a way that makes sense, right? Same with these black 
uh, obelisks, right? They're magic objects in that sense. So then the, the last thing to maybe say about this, well, two things. So the witness is a pretty big game, and it has six or 700, like what I'll call for now, puzzle units, where a lot of them are like those little puzzle panels, but not, not all of them. Um, and each one of those has its own idea, and those ideas can form sequences like the one I showed with the black and white spots. And those sequences, right, make patterns of uh, elaboration on more and more complex ideas. But what I do very often in this game is break the sequence uh, in different ways all the time, right? Um, and that break creates surprise. Um, even before the sequence is broken, or if you don't get to the sequence break because it's too hard or something, um, you still have this uh, enjoyment of the sequence that you can have in music or poetry of variations, right? I don't know how it's gonna rhyme, but I know that it will. Uh, and then I enjoy seeing how it's gonna rhyme. I don't know how Ludmila's gonna manage to be there to introduce this next chapter, but I know that she will, and so I enjoy seeing how it happens. Um, here's an example of another sequence break that I'm just gonna explain. Total spoiler, but hopefully people have played. Um, there's a sequence of puzzles in which there's not information on the tree or on the panel to give you the answer, but there's like some trees in the background and the environment around you that somehow give you the answer and they do it uh, by the position of this apple being key. And so you go through these variations of, you know, the tree having different aspects or you have to see it in a slightly different way every time but the apple is always there telling you the answer and your goal is look for the apple, figure out how that corresponds to this puzzle panel and then I've solved it. And then there's four trees or five like that, I think there were five and then I cut it, so there's probably four, but whatever it is, <laughs> the last tree in this sequence um, breaks the sequence because there's no apple. So like the thing that you've been focusing on, this very red, shiny, attention-grabbing object that you've been focusing on is gone, right? But <laughs> the answer to the puzzle is consistent with some things that were in the earlier puzzles that you probably didn't notice, right? Um, but sequence breaks are delicate, right? So, so when you break a sequence like that or break a pattern, you must not violate the player's trust. And, you know, one way you can do that is just by not, not being cheap, right? Use your, use your subjective guidance. But there's something also in the memos that strikes me as really relevant. And uh, this is actually Calvino talking about the writing process. He's talking about Mercury's time and Vulcan's time. Um, and he says, you know, to paraphrase, his process involves a really long time of apparently not being very productive. Uh, but then at the end, there can be a flash of insight that immediately takes on the finality of that which was inevitable, right? And this kind of epiphany in, in the memos is part of what <laughs> makes this working schedule uh, what it is. Um, but part of my MO in making games now is something like this, um, having this kind of experience as an author and then illustrating that experience for the players so that they have a similar experience, right? So they can feel this little miniature kind of epiphany. Um, and then because the epiphanies in this game are about things, that occur in the real world, like structure of things like trees or light and shadow and colors, um, then you can think about those epiphanies or be reminded of them as you walk around in the real world and maybe they can rub off a little bit um, on the flavor of the way that you see the real world. Uh, now the last thing to say is that with 600 plus little sentences, um, you can make a lot of patterns and that means you can break a lot of patterns in surprising ways. And you can do so many, right? The Witness is such a big game that if you play the whole thing, you come upon a second order consistency, right? The first order consistency is the regularity of these puzzles and the structure of the laser beams and all that. The second order consistency is that you experience so many of these sequence breaks or surprises um, that that comes to define the feel of the game. And it's why it feels different from many other puzzle games, right? So just like in a poem, the player expects to be surprised, but doesn't know how he's gonna be surprised. Uh, that's it, we've gone on too long. I will say, one other topic, I, I can, like I said, I never can do justice to how much influence Calvino's work uh, has had on the way I think and behave now. Uh, one completely other topic that I was gonna talk about had to do with 
The Non-Existent Night and Discovery of the Birds, which is a short story in Cosmic Comics, and uh, using a metaphor to set up a transcendent leap, um, which I think is very important. It's probably more important than what I talked about today even, but I, I couldn't do it and I especially couldn't do both. I'm gonna record this at home at some point and put it up on YouTube. Uh, and uh, that's it, so uh, thank you for your time. So um, I've been told that we have time for a few questions. We are, we're trying to keep a structured schedule, so we kind of want to keep the questions short and the answers short and the questions to be legit questions on topic about this and not like programming languages or like, <laughs> you know, what do you think of the Nintendo Switch or something? Uh, so anyone yeah, over here? Yeah. Are there something kind of mysterious about that or special about that? Yes. I'm wondering, um, what do you think about people trying to 100% the witness kind of counts and puzzles, looking for something final, anything and trying to keep the bit of truth in, in terms of that issue? Well, it's the natural extension of that drive, right? On the one hand. And and it's great. I mean, I'm, so that's a wonderful thing because on the other hand, uh, it could be that you release the game and not enough people really care to get that far even. So, so that's great. Um, I think we're in an, a different environment now too. This is like a new thing that people are able to communicate enough to like go on the internet and form groups of mutual interests that can do this. So I, I feel like if Invisible Cities had been released, I mean, if the internet had existed back then, people probably wouldn't have the attention span to read something like that anyway. But um, if you can make that mental uh, association, I feel like it's that kind of thing also where, you know, I think most people who read Invisible Cities probably don't go that far into trying to like decrypt it. But I think a small number of people would, you know, get together on the internet and really try to do everything, right? Um, but that's why though, you know, the, in, the, the witness, for example, never tells you 100% complete Right? And it never, you know, for example, with these, well, it's, I'm not going to, it's 100 slides ago or something, but with the visual things that we put in the world, there's not a definitive list of those, and you can't ever know if you've understood them. And even if you have understood them, then for sure you're never going to understand all the ramifications of the audio recordings that are in the game, because I don't even completely, right? The reason all that material interests me is I haven't personally come to the end of it, right? And so it's, designed in some sense that it's not completely possible to come to the end of it. And that's my way of dealing with that. I thought a great deal about this, you know, and so for the middle, I, I mean, I've said so many spoilers, but for the kind of secret puzzles that I didn't really say that much about, um, uh, I thought a lot about how easy should I make it to find those because people have a completionist urge. Uh, so you don't want to waste their time. You want to be nice to people, and you don't want to have to make them scour every corner of a world because something might be there. I actually, I did that in Braid, but that's a much smaller world, you know, and it is sort of conceived as a more hardcore thing. Uh, whereas this is, um, I wanted to be nicer to people, and also 3D, it's just so, it's so easy to be cheap in 3D. You could have made something small, like bug-sized, hidden in a crack somewhere that looks like a rendering glitch, and like, surprise, you're supposed to see that. So. There's a, there's a great deal of delicacy that comes into determining these things. And all I can say is I thought very hard about it, about both making the things that I was asking people to be find, to find to be worth their attention and also making sure you could never come to the end of the game as a whole. Okay. Uh, I don't know. How do you, how do you pick? Um, <laughs> let's go. I'm not wearing my glasses, but back, back here. Yeah. Yes. Dude, that's a whole. That's like a three hour speech right there. So, part of this one that I cut, um, 
related very heavily to Giovanna's introduction about um, attempting to drive toward the egoless or, or the empty. Um, one of the quotes I have here in my cut slides uh, is from a Calvino essay uh, called Levels of Reality in Literature. And you know, he says, such a formulation uh, might, in the limit, we would arrive at a blank page at silence at absence, um, which on the one hand, if you're reading it a little bit cynically, might seem a little too uh, zen or a little too pat. Um, but I understand what he's getting at because it's, it's magical, you know. Um, absence, when you can manage to do something eliminatively and more silently, um, then amazing things happen. So uh, why does this, it goes out of slide presentation mode if you go to the end. It's like the worst design software. Anyway, so forget it. Um, so uh, f amazing things happen. So you know the, the two pattern breaks that I talked about in Braid go in the direction of silence by eliminating names. They don't break by doing something else, right? By having the title in purple or rendered with like stylized computer glitch or something, right? Um, although we do something like that elsewhere. Uh, but uh, in, in those particular cases, it's because there's some kind of a magic and a, in, the, in this case, according to my sensibilities, a gravitas that was gained in those situations. But another thing that can happen that's not gravitas is you can go in the other direction and you can get humor. You can get spontaneous humor that just erupts from nowhere that you understand, right? Um, and I think if we're gonna talk about something for this millennium, uh, aside from all the, all the reading material we've already been get, given, there's a very interesting thing uh, interesting task in art about getting closer to silence, which involves egolessness, right? Because your ego is basically a voice in your head that does not want silence, right? It wants the opposite of silence. It wants to be talking at you all the time. And so um, getting closer to that and s just seeing what it's like and seeing what happens. Um, so humor, I mean, I'm, I'm too tired to think of explicit examples in The Witness, but there's some stuff, actually I can think of some examples. I don't have slides, but there's, there's jokes in The Witness. Um, and th there are professional comedians, uh, like I was talking to Adam, Adam Conover on his podcast, who makes his living as a funny person, and he called those out as jokes. So he recognized them as not just humor, right, as something funny, but a joke. A joke is like linguistic telling of humor, right? Um, but in a nonverbal situation, and we're not gonna, we're, we're out of time, so we're not gonna say what those are, but maybe, maybe during wine or something. Last question. Uh, you raise your hand first. You were very energetic, but he, <laughs> he raised it first. Um, So, okay, when I was in high school or something, right, um, I had this picture that is probably encouraged or not discouraged by traditional American school. I don't know how it is now, but because I'm old. But I had this picture that like the meaningful stuff in fiction was like secret messages that the author put in that you're supposed to decode, which is ironic because that's what I talked about today. But um, <laughs> so how am I gonna make this point coherently? Uh, Um, but okay, so, so when you set out to try to do that, and that's the point of the work as a whole, like if that's the deepest it gets, is ah, I put a message in there that someone will get out, then it's a little shallow. Um, what I, and, and it becomes contrived, it feels contrived, right? And so what I have found through experimentation is that the things that work for me, the things that feel good, like I will not feel bad if I then give this out to the world, is when I personally am wrestling with things that I don't completely understand. 
I do not have mastery over them and they feel important to me, right? So then I make something around that and then I just have faith that other people out there in the world will have the same kind of interest or the same kind of response. I can't control if they do or not. Um, and I'm a pretty weird person, so there's a priori not that much of a reason to believe that other people have the same interests, but apparently enough do, right? And so that is, that is how I source what my games are about. They have to be, I have to not completely understand what they're about, but not in like an arbitrary way, like, oh, I don't know, right? It's like I've wrestled with this and it's really interesting and I see a lot of it, but it goes somewhere that I don't totally see. Then I know it's worth spending years of my, I spent eight years on The Witness or six and a half on the bulk of it, right? Like that's a long time. To want to do something like that, you have to really care. So, yeah. All right, hey, if anyone wants to talk more, I'll be around at the drinks and stuff. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it has been an honor. Thank you.